Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the APTA Sustainability Committee webinar today. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, focusing on the business case for sustainability. Uh, this webinar is put on by the APTA Sustainability Committee, and my name is Elizabeth Lovingood. I serve as the staff advisor for the committee. Just to help frame today's session, let me provide a brief, brief history of how it came to be developed. Um, in, a, in the fall of 2018, the Sustainability Committee developed a work plan for the next two years and set out some objectives for 2019 and 2020. And one of those objectives was to develop a webinar series that provided training to sustainability committee members as well as sharing of best practices. Uh, so today's session is actually the first webinar in our webinar series. Uh, and we had reached out to committee members and asked what topic would it be of interest or helpful to you? Uh, and making how to make the case for sustainability rose to the top. And uh, we ended up deciding to broaden the audience to other uh, relevant committees as well. So the participants on today's webinar, both the moderators and the speakers, um, have all volunteered to help plan and, and develop the webinar. And they've been really hard at work the past two months and to create today's program. And we've brought together a, a really diverse and interesting panel who have some great insights into not only making the case for sustainability, but also how to move your program forward. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our moderator today, and that is Noreen Walker. Noreen? Hello, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Although many, uh, I'm really excited to be participating with you today on today's webinar about sustainability. I have been with Virginia Railway Express for five years although many more years in the field of transportation. I just want to make sure that I remind you to be safe where you are. Among the many ways that sustainability has been defined, the simplest and most fundamental is the ability to sustain or put another way, the capacity to endure. Any project or proposal has an opportunity to introduce sustainability elements. It's not just about the environment. We are pleased to have you here today and thank you for participating. Our presenters today have a range of experience from representatives of agencies with a long history of experience with sustainability to those with more recent experience as well as a geographic mix. Today's agenda includes a very interesting PowerPoint presented by Clary, which will be followed by a panel discussion with short presentations followed by questions. We hope that the topic will help to educate you as well as to have you think about implementation in your own organization. Thank you again for participation. 
After our last speaker, we will continue our conversation with the panelists and then open the floor for your questions. Use the question box found on your screen to submit your questions. We will read aloud and address your questions during the Q&A segment of the session. Our first presenter is Clary Kutu. Clary, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Clary Kutu. I'm Director of Environmental Affairs for Keolis Commuter Services in Boston. Keolis is the operator of the fifth largest passenger rail system in the country, owned by the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. In my role, I manage and direct environmental services program, which include the maintenance of more than 700 drainage systems, 100 existing tanks and fueling systems, two wastewater treatment plants, septic systems, solid and hazardous waste management, emergency response, compliance of more than 200 federal, state, and local permits for 28 facilities, and the management and implementation of a yearly operating plan for a vegetation management plan that covers a span of more than 400 miles of track. I'm also responsible and accountable for the implementation of the ISO 14001 environmental management system. I believe it is the first railroad to have a third party certified EMS. Next. I'm here to share with you how sustainability makes a difference from the perspective of an operator and our purpose as industry leaders. Next. The transportation industry moves the economic growth of our country. And as leaders in the industry, we have a responsibility to communicate the importance of sustainability in our everyday operations. So what does sustainability mean to you? And how do you make sustainability work for your business? APTA has developed a strong platform to engage public transit agencies and transportation professionals nationwide uh, to begin the conversation of how we implement in the next in the near future sustainability programs and they have framed sustainability in the APTA commitment as preserving the environment being socially responsible and maintaining economic vitality with an overall contribution to quality of life next the transportation industry is facing as well many challenges. As industry leaders, we need to make a strong case for sustainability and climate resiliency. It's no longer an option. Uh, we need to make sure that we incorporate climate resiliency in our planning. And I have um, quoted Dr. Jacob, all modes of transportation need to take into account a robust climate and sea level rise projection for all their capital spending projects. Not investing in these resilience measures will be more expensive by factors of four to 10 and incur direct and economic losses. Next. In 2018, nationwide, we have seen an increase in the severity and the frequency of significant weather events um, from nor'easters to Santa Ana winds to uh, dry, dry, <laughs> dry spells and um, flood prone areas there were no there were not flood prone areas um, significant increase in tornadoes and hurricanes um, these all next these all have a significant in economic impact not only to operations but to our nation in terms of uh, resources and um, this particular graph uh, is available. It's a very interactive tool um, from NOAA. And all the resources that I'm going to provide to you are found at the end of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, really good websites with information. Um, but it's really important to note how much it has increased in the last decade. Next. So our purpose as industry leaders, of course, is to consider future generations while making present decisions. Uh, we have population growth, economic growth, market demand, stakeholder expectations, technology, that added to you know, limited resources, climate change and resiliency planning and continuity of operations really establish a strong framework and a business case that we can move forward to promote sustainability. 
Next. The concept of sustainability is composed of three pillars, um, economic, environmental, and social, also known as profits, planet, and people, the three Ps. Sustainability emerged as a component of corporate ethics in response, in response to perceived public discontent over the long-term damage caused by a focus on short-term profits. When I reference in my presentation dimensions of sustainability, I really do reference the key elements that are um, incorporated into this diagram. I, this diagram is a World Wide Web diagram that I really love because it really does in, um, showcase the different interdependent uh, dimensions of sustainability. Um, when I reference sustainability dimensions, uh, you can come back to this diagram later and really realize that there are many elements. It's not just about environmental impact. It's about how the um, aspects of business operations um, are interdependent amongst all three. Next. So the triple bottom line is an industry, private industry kind of term. Uh, many of you may be aware of what this term um, means, and maybe this is the first time you hear about it. It's the same as sustainability, but in the corporate world, we relate to the triple bottom line because it's a financial framework. Um, and the triple bottom line concept is basically how a business assess, maintains, profits, economic growth through their corporate sustainability solutions and the ability to survive, adapt to changing dyna dynamics and future demands. And this positions a business to achieve greater business value through strategic planning aligned via performance objectives that considered, of course, those three Ps, um, uh, social, economic, and environmental dimensions, and the development of a business model that reflects a balanced approach for continual improvement. Next. The benefits, of course, are many. Each dimension in sustainability, you can probably um, have many more benefits aligned. Um, but mostly, you actually uh, increase revenue with market innovations and new market opportunities. You increase market competitiveness, employee satisfaction and retention, social responsibility, um, reduce costs through management of resources and risk and liability. You demonstrate and improve compliance, improve your public profile, improve resiliency, adaptation, and continuity of operations. Next. It's all in the planning, and sometimes it might be overwhelming for companies uh, or for organizations who have not tackled the implementation of a sustainability program. Um, you don't have to start big. You can start small with an initiative. Uh, be smart about it. Be specific in defining your goals that are measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And I have um, highlighted relevant because this is where you actually tie in those dimensions of sustainability. Um, one project can actually touch on multiple dimensions of sustainability. Next. Building a strong business case, um, it's all about money. Um, at times, it's really important that we understand your we understand our business operation objectives. We really have to um, understand where we are in our fiscal challenges, our strategic planning, our legal requirements, our market demands. Um, so at times you have to pick your battles, in, in other words, quantify risk and liability. Pick those um, specific objectives that are key in the management not only of operations, but that you can tie in those sustainability dimensions. Uh, learn how to define return on investments, ROIs, or internal rates of return, um, or do cost-benefit analysis. Um, many of you may not have um, the uh, skills or the knowledge to do these, but you do have a financial department that can help you align these uh, specific assessments. You can also um, do materiality assessments or vulnerability assessments, anything that can help you quantify and or identify what are the key um, objectives that you want to align to those dimensions of sustainability. Ultimately, you have to talk the language management understands, which is 
typically in, in dollar signs, right? Demonstrate your triple bottom line sustainability benefits and establish objectives that balance operations, continual improvement actions to support financial stability and growth. Next. And once you have an inventory of your business operations and priorities, you can begin integrating dimensions of sustainability and align these to corporate decision process with a clear vision uh, or clear objectives. This helps develop a strategic roadmap for execution, implementation. Um, try to develop a proposal and or presentation. Identify who your champions are within your organization. Um, time your presentation before your fiscal year decision process. To me, this is really critical. Understand the cycle of funding in your organization. And if your fiscal year begins on July 1st, try to time your management review or your senior level management meeting or your fiscal management meeting uh, with a proposal at least three to four months ahead of time. Because if within that time period you get your um, um, uh, programs approved, then you can uh, tie in the next year's budget cycle or capital uh, program cycle. Um, once you have a roadmap of clear objectives that have been aligned to uh, your organizational uh, goals, then you can develop a continual improvement program and execute an annual plan and roadmap. Next. So as Keolis, um, as an operator, we have challenges very similar that you might have as well. Um, transportation infrastructure, uh, we're coming across a time where infrastructure is aged, our workforce has changed, our fleet management um, or our fleet um, has changed as well. So we need to work very closely uh, with the MBTA and MassDOT in the execution of many of our um, objectives, capital investment programs. Next. And Keolis um, develops a corporate strategy built on seven pillars um, to achieve our goals. And our corporate strategy incorporates a continuous improvement program. Next. This continuous improvement program is updated on a yearly basis. So at the fourth quarter of every year, each of the um, seven work streams, safety, operational excellence, customer experience, employee engagement, economic performance, partnering with our public transit authorities, corporate social responsibility, they each, each work stream has an owner and many champions. Our yearly objectives are aligned with targets that are both quantitative and qualitative. And we develop a roadmap that incorporates quarterly milestones to meet those objectives. And these quarterly milestones sometimes cross over departments. And we use um, the methodology for RACI, which is responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Next. But ultimately, you need to understand that at the senior level, the general manager our VPs are all accountable for the execution of these um, milestones. Um, and buying into that requires that I present to them on a yearly basis measurable and sometimes qualitative goals that will uh, align those dimensions of sustainability with the corporate objectives, our legal requirements with the MBTA and other. It is important also to, as I mentioned before, to actually um, be able to showcase and manage this roadmap. A visualization room in your organization is important. Somewhere where you can bring all these elements to, um, to the table for discussion, for monitoring, and for updates. And this is a, a location where you can visually um, um, depict all your progress within your roadmap on a yearly basis. Next. When you have a continual improvement program um, that is constantly being managed and monitored, 
you actually achieve results. And on a short-term, long-term basis, this is what you want to see your organization um, being able to effectively manage and see. And in my experience, next. In my experience, um, making the business case, if you will, um, is mostly about culture change. And culture change is very, very difficult, at least in the railroad industry. Uh, for those of you who are relatively new to railroad industry, it's really difficult. Um, so, you know, I, I selected my champions in each operations team and I educated them and, um, and build alliances with them and understand quickly, uh, made a case to understand business operations um, from start to finish. So when I'm building a case and making a case, I need to really know how to talk the talk and walk the walk. Um, persistence and consistency of message is really important. Uh, you will find many roadblocks and you need to reprioritize the dimensions of sustainability and how you incorporate these into a roadmap. Um, that fit your business objectives because the tra transportation industry is quite dynamic. Learn how to talk money, um, take a training, understand how to quantify benefits, cost benefit analysis, and long term impacts. This is really critical. And lastly, um, learn how to showcase your team's work and your progress. Um, you're the agent of change for your organization. Um, and it's a big responsibility for you, but you really do need to showcase your team's progress and their work. Um, and I think with that being said, um, thank you all. Next. Thank you all. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I have many resources for you to look at um, from Volpe Center organizations, um, resources for leadership development, um, reporting, um, and, and other. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Clary. The results that uh, Keolis has experienced are really, really impressive. Any final words to encourage uh, public transportation agencies as they aspire to and plan for similar goals? I think when, when you're in a large organization, it's, um, it can be overwhelming because uh, the departments are more spread out. Um, as a business operator, um, we have specific targeted contractual requirements. However, um, transit agencies really do have a really good pool of support, not only from APTA, but contractors. and you know, the first step is to really look at what those risks, what those um, key um, management principles and objectives, clear vision that the organization might have. And sometimes you don't need to start from scratch. Sometimes just understanding what a business, what the organization's business plan is, uh, can help because from that business management plan, um, you can actually align those dimensions of sustainability and uh, really tie those into um, initiatives that might get um, quicker buy-in, if you will. Very good. Thank you so much. I wanted to note in the resource, uh, the resources list, there's a TRB Sustainability Committee. There's also a TCRP Sustainability Toolkit for agencies that you can look for as well. Thank you, Clary, for your thoughtful presentation. That's been great. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our uh, to participants on the panel. We want to give the attendees for the webinar a context for application and an idea of others' experiences. So the panelists are invited to take a few minutes to introduce their organization and make a couple of, remar of remarks. So Pam, we're happy to have you present the perspective from an economist side. Pam? Thank you very much, Noreen. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, unlike some of the other uh, members of this webinar, I actually do not come from 
an agency perspective, but rather I, I support agencies when they're trying to think about sustainability, um, both internally and also externally. And one of the things that we've um, discovered is that, you know, there's different tools for different types of applications. And so I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. Um, just in the way of background, I've been with HDR for nearly 10 years and have been involved in um, monetizing benefits, including sustainability ben benefits, for as long as I've been with the company. Um, next. So a little bit about what we call sustainable value analysis. Uh, Clary talked about this triple bottom line thinking, which I suspect most of you are familiar with, but I'll do a real quick um, just reminder on what, we're, what we mean when we talk about triple bottom line. So often agencies are required to think about the financial return on investment when they make a particular infrastructure investment or commitment to sustainability or some other dollar outlay that they're being asked to um, make uh, explain why and one of the things that it comes across pretty quickly is that sometimes there's not just a financial argument for taking on a sustainability perspective sometimes you actually need to think about um, sustainability and the reasons for an investment from a more holistic perspective so you need to think about the economics certainly but there are other factors that are really important to public agencies when they're trying to provide uh, transportation services to um, to people in their communities. And so when we talk about a triple bottom line, we're talking about environmental and social factors as well. And by environmental, I'm thinking of emissions uh, reduction, that sort of thing, maybe some wastewater, uh, better ways of handling water. And when we're thinking about social factors, that could be health, that could be public safety, it might just be a simple quality of life. So that's what we're referring to when we refer to um, triple bottom line. And uh, if you just click the button, this concept of sustainability value. Next slide, please. So why would you want to incorporate sustainability? Well, Clary talked about the importance of doing it at the agency level, but there are other reasons to think about um, measuring sustainability as well. For example, public outreach. Uh, you can actually have pretty good success if you're able to put some dollar values on some important factors that are uh, that reflect sustainable investment or even if you can only do sort of some quantification of some of those benefits it's a very helpful tool for people who are trying to engage the community or provide elected officials with a rationale for making an investment in a sustainable infrastructure also, federal grants uh, require some sort of monetization of benefits, and those benefits can include things like health, and they can include, uh, you know, public safety, emissions reduction, and so forth. So um, that's another reason why thinking about how your investments might benefit from a sustainability perspective can be advantageous. You can position yourself well for federal grants. Uh, people also use it um, for project prioritization or alternatives analysis when they have several options and they're trying to figure out which one will actually achieve more of their goals. Next. So just a couple examples of the kinds of things you think about when you're valuing sustainability. Uh, we try to consider all the significant economic, social, and environmental outcomes we can come up with when we're uh, contemplating an investment in sustainable infrastructure. And we try to quantify those, but also put a dollar value on those when possible. And there's a lot of guidance, some of which Clary included in her resources list, and, and some of which I'd be happy to provide if people have an interest in this, um, on how to do that. And, and the point really is to sort of involve your community in the decision making, make them understand through a really transparent process what you're doing to come up with these monetary values, and, and just sort of further the argument for why it's important to make investments in things that will do more than just uh, necessarily benefit the agency, that there are some public benefits that can be generated as a result. Next. So how do we do this? Well, the, the first thing we try to think about is, you know, who is it, uh, what, what is the kind of owner that you are? Are you a private owner? Are you a public owner? In this case, we're talking about a lot of um, transit agencies. So as a public owner, um, how, how can you actually think about sustainability and, and um, reflecting uh, sustainable outcomes in some sort of quantitative or monetary way? 
Well, it depends a great deal on how detailed your data is. If you're only at the planning stage, you're, you're maybe more limited in what you can actually put a dollar value on, but you can also do some other things that can help you make the argument for why the infrastructure that you're planning to invest in is worthwhile. Uh, if you have more um, design, even a conceptual design, you can actually um, sometimes come up with a return on investment, which Clary mentioned, uh, but also some, some indication of, of cost. So, for example, if you have a, a relatively good handle on what the design is that you're looking at for your investment, you will know what the capital costs are likely to be. You'll have a sense of perhaps longer term operations and maintenance. And you may also have an, an understanding of what it is that this investment will do. So for example, for transit agencies, that might be increased ridership. That might be better connect uh, different modes of transportation. And there are lots of different ways to put value on that. And um, you know, as I mentioned, the USDOT provides guidance, but there's also a fair amount of literature out there that uh, think tanks and others have come up with that can help you put those, those values to these important factors. Next. One of the things we wind up doing a lot of is what we call multi-criteria analysis, and this is sort of handy because it allows you to consider qualitative, quantitative, and monetizable um, benefits. And really what you do is you try to identify what your overall goals are, and then you establish what we call criteria. So that might be reducing emissions, could be improving connectivity, it might be health outcomes, could be a variety of criteria that are consistent with your agency's goals. And then you figure out how you're going to evaluate whether a particular project you intend to make uh, is likely to achieve those goals. And um, there's a, a conversation about weighting, you know, which of those criteria is most important. But what it allows you to do is come up with a scoring of a particular transit improvement or other uh, infrastructure investment that reflects sustainability and gives you a sense of which one is more likely to achieve your sustainability goals. Next. This is just sort of an example of some of the outputs you can come up with. Um, some of them, like the annual savings of reduced vehicle operating costs, is something that can be monetized. If you click the next button, you'll see that we can think about quantitative things. So maybe we can't put a dollar value on it, but we certainly can put a number on it. And then finally, uh, if you click one more time, there are some things like, you know, safe routes to school or additional green space or other things that are really important to highlight but may not be easily quantifiable or monetizable. And the point is that you should really think about the different benefits that your project's going to bring and, and try to come up with some useful metrics. And, and I, we find this useful um, in a variety of ways, as I mentioned before, but particularly when you're, you're talking to people in your community. Next. That's really all I wanted to say other than um, just, you know, just think outside the box a little bit in terms of how to relay the conversation of sustainability and how to express how a particular investment is going to achieve sustainable outcomes. And if you ever have any interest in um, additional resources, by all means, please uh, reach out to me. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Pam. A lot of good information with some terminology that is quite frankly new to me. So I look mm -hmm. forward to reviewing the slides when I have a little more time. And if you have any questions specifically for Pam, please use the tool that we have and we can answer those at the end. So our next participant is Amy Shatskin. Amy is from Tra Sound Transit and brings us a perspective from where transit and environmental have overlapped for about 20 years. Amy? Hi, thank you so much for having me on this webinar. Um, so I'm Amy Shatskin. I'm, I'm one of the deputy directors in Sound Transit's Office of Environmental Affairs and Sustainability, and I direct our uh, sustainability program. And I'm going to talk today about our sort of business case for our program, as well as some of our initiatives, and then transit for a whole. And I'm going to touch on a lot of, especially what Pam talked about uh, as well. So that was a really nice that you got to see the details, and I'm going to sort of give you a little bit of a high-level uh, agency perspective. Actually, you can go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit about who we are. We're a relatively young, mid-size agency. We were established in 1996 as the Regional Transit Authority for Central Puget Sound. We serve a little bit over 3 million people, um, which is about 40% of our state's population, and we cover uh, three counties and 54 cities. In 2018, um, we served 48 million people on our uh, bus, light rail, and commuter rail services, 
And I think it's also really important to note that we're not just an operator, but we're also in the midst of a, a huge um, transit expansion project, which is one of the larger transit infrastructure projects in the country currently. Um, actually, my number is a little bit off. We're actually adding 62 miles of light rail, so we will have 116 miles of light rail when we're done in the next 25 years. Next slide. Um, and I also want to note that, you know, although environmental values are a core sort of regional value here in the Pacific Northwest, it really wasn't until 10 years after the agency began operations that we began to think about um, sort of the, the agency's role um, in environmental policy and sustainability. And as a reflection of this regional value, actually go, go back to the last, you can stay on the last slide. Um, our sustainability mandate is really broad and it encompasses, you know, really every aspect of our agency's work. And I think it's really key that, you know, the first agency policy statement on sustainability used the term sustainable business practices because it really signaled um, from our leadership to our, our staff and uh, board and stakeholders, you know, that there's a value proposition for sustainability. Next. And I just want to sort of touch on sort of how our, our timeline of the sustainability program developed and the evolution of the program and how it really speaks to sort of slowly building the business case. Um, and really the takeaway from my timeline is that we didn't start out by having a fully funded sustainability effort. You know, each step really built on the previous and, and sort of demonstrated benefits for, for our agency. Um, in 2004 actually, which is off my timeline, uh, we established our environmental management system. Um, and in 2007, we expanded that to include sustainability. Uh, and then our first sustainability policy, uh, uh, you know, wasn't developed until 2007 as well. And then it wasn't until 2011 that we had our first sustainability plan, which really talked about detailed implementation. Um, and that was also the year that we began our participation uh, in the APTA sustainability commitment. And again, it was another 10 years later of planning and implementation um, before we were able to, in 2016, um, pass a ballot initiative that included uh, fully funding our sustainability program. And I just want to underscore that um, for us, uh, participation in the FTA's Environmental Management System program was really integral to developing our sustainability program. Um, and now we have this environmental and sustainability management system, and that's the tool that we use to manage both um, our environmental compliance uh, as well you know, which includes regulatory risk, as well as our voluntary sustainability commitments. And nesting these voluntary commitments sort of inside this regulatory compliance has provided, I think, a great deal of rigor and visibility for our sustainability initiatives. And a, a lot of the language that Clary used about continual improvement and milestones and targets, um, you know, is all sort of the framework that the, the EMS um, really can help you provide in your program. Next. Um, just a few examples, um, sort of building on what Pam was talking about and implementing our program, we found a lot of uh, co-benefits, um, which really helps us demonstrate our value day in and day out. Um, in managing our ESMS, we have a steering committee that includes senior managers and directors from every department at our agency. And like Clary mentioned, um, you know, having champions is really important. Uh, and this has become a really crucial forum at the agency um, to sort of break down silos and, and uh, really foster collaboration. Um, additionally, um, we've been able to really reduce our environmental risk or risk from fees and, and uh, permit violations by having an EMS. Um, so there, there's some you know, real financial benefits to that as well. Um, as we've rolled out green building and performance standards for our design, um, it's really helped us uh, not only develop an integrated design process uh, and create resource efficient buildings and smart projects, but it's also really helped us on the management side by creating a more efficient communication between staff and our contractors. You know, there's, when we use LEED um, green building standards and uh, green infrastructure standards like LEED and Envision, it really um, creates a shared language to um, help com with communication and expectations and understanding um, when goals have been met between staff and contractors. And last but not least, um, as both Pam and Clary talked about, reporting has been really important to us. Every year we report on our environmental and sustainability performance, um, of, and we focus on our agency operations. And tracking this data has really enabled us to communicate the benefit of our services to our agency, 
uh, staff and board members, as well as our writers and other political stakeholders. Next. Um, I just wanted to give you an example of some of the elements that we routinely include in any business case for agency project, and this really builds on a lot of what Pam talked about as well. Um, when we talk to decision makers, we compare the capital cost of a project or product over its lifetime to savings uh, and as well as, you know, other impacts and benefits. And often it is the co-benefits of a project, you know, that actually sells it to our, to our leadership and decision makers. Um, we've had some energy efficiency projects where the paybacks are really long, um, but it really cuts down on replacement cycles. And so it's, those projects have been okayed because it frees up staff time. Um, and with one of our earliest green building projects, um, we got the green light on it, not because it saved some money, which it did from the resource saving side, but also because um, it was felt that it would really help give us a leg up, you know, as part of the federal funding um, opportunity that was available to us. Um, we also had an upgrade project on our, um, uh, one of our rail engines that was, you know, again, it would, didn't save money, but we could demonstrate that it saved um, a lot of uh, emissions from criteria air pollutants and would have a, a, a clear improvement on public health in the region. Um, next, uh, this is just a, a quick uh, snapshot of some of the data that we use to demonstrate our savings from resource conservation. Um, I'm just going to skip through this to get to the, the next slide. Um, I just sure want to end by circling back to the theme of reporting on the sustainability value of your transit system as a whole. Um, this is a really key part of the annual reporting that we do. Um, the main way that we express our benefit from our transit system is uh, in greenhouse gas emission savings. And, the, and there's um, very clear guidance about how to do this um, via the app to sustainability commitment and the accompanying um, sort of guidebook about how to put the metrics together. So for every ton of emissions produced by sound transit operations, which is the, the blue part of the graphic, um, we divert the emissions of more than six times that throughout our region when residents choose transit, and that's what you see in orange. Um, and in 2017, we actually displaced 5% more emissions than 2016. Next. And then it's also really important to take this data and to translate it into tangible terms. So we save the residents in the region the emissions equivalent to powering more than 45,000 homes for a year or the burning 48 million gallons of gasoline. And so um, it's through information like this that we're really able to demonstrate that as a result of our ridership and also our efficiency and other sustainability initiatives, um, that we can demonstrate the benefits of what we provide to the region. Thanks, that's it. Thank you, Amy. Some great accomplishments in the Seattle area, which definitely could be transported elsewhere. And I appreciate your reaching back to both Clary and, um, and, and Pam's presentations in your discussion, Amy. Thank you for that. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce Chelsea Honsey. Chelsea has joined to share some experience from a smaller agency with a little less experience, specifically in the sustainability arena. Chelsea? Thank you. I wanted to kind of start out by explaining a little bit about Metrolink, um, one of many Metrolinks in the country um, and one of the smaller ones. So we are located in Moline, Illinois, which is in the Illinois Quad Cities. So we're about three hours west of Chicago. Our service area is about 150,000 uh, residents. And we operate fixed route service, uh, paratransit service, as well as ferry boat service on the Mississippi River. Um, we have about 62 vehicles, and we provide 3.5 million trips per year. Next slide. Um, so really what started our, um, or the way in which we kind of dipped our feet in sustainability is through um, replacements of our fleet with alternative fuel vehicles. That started back in 2002. We actually partnered with John Deere. So John Deere um, is based in Moline and is a a company that um, was a really great partner for us, not only um, on implementing this new technology, but also in um, public education and getting ownership from the community and what we were doing. So over um, from between 2002 and 2016, we um, transitioned about 85% of our fleet to compressed natural gas. Um, and then last year we started um, 
transitioning vehicles to battery electric buses. So we introduced our first three Proterra battery electric buses uh, with five more that will be shipping uh, within the next two weeks. We've also been working on facility improvements. Um, started out with two electric bus chargers and have now implemented a ceiling mounted charging system uh, to accommodate what will be eight Proterra buses um, in a relatively small storage space. Um, kind of one of our efforts to creatively use the new technology within um, you know, limited capacity. And then we have nine uh, diesel buses that are remaining and they'll be replaced with either CNG and or electric over the next one to three years. Um, we see a value in having a mixed um, fleet of both electric and CNG buses. Um, so one of our questions we often get is if we're converting to completely electric and um, I think we'll have a combination. Next slide. Um, the graph here shows some of the data we've collected over the first year of having diesel, electric, and CNG buses in our fleet, and we're seeing a pretty substantial cost savings to the electric buses. I'll talk a little bit more in my next slide about um, facility and solar array, which has contributed to the cost savings for electric buses, um, but did want to note here that we had a lot of data before we implemented um, some of these vehicles but didn't necessarily have the staff expertise or resources to dive into the data. So as a small system, we partnered with a local university and their engineering department, and were able to obtain two senior engineering students who used this as their uh, senior project in terms of um, seeing real world examples of operating costs, um, fueling costs, maintenance costs, and able, was able to give us a really great snapshot that we could use to our elected officials, to the general public, and also as we go out and seek uh, grant opportunities in the future. Next slide. Data shown here is relatively small um, in comparison to some of the other systems, but this is a snapshot that we've um, received from our Proterra dashboard. So since May of last year, our initial three buses have saved over 19,000 gallons of diesel fuel and 201 tons of CO2. Um, we're continuing to populate this information on our social media, website, uh, monitors on our buses, and definitely something that we're trying to convey to the public as a case for sustainability. Next slide. Um, some of our most recent uh, sustainability programs evolving beyond our fleet vehicles has been infrastructure. So in 2014, we opened our new operations and maintenance facility. It was a $42 million project, which provides um, over 1,800 solar panels on the roof, which really has tied in well to our electric bus fleet deployment um, and has saved us about $175,000 to date. Uh, we've also recently constructed a new passenger terminal, which was um, recently achieved uh, lead silver. So all new infrastructure going forward, we've committed to designing to lead standards. Next slide. Kind of the final piece that we have taken a lot of pride in is how we educate the public on our sustainability initiative. Um, the Quad Cities is an urbanized area, but very much a Midwest um, area. The average commute is about 18 minutes. So sometimes it can be challenging to make the case not only for transit, but for sustainability and the investment. And so we've done a lot of work with uh, Mid-American Energy, John Deere, and other community partners um, to create creative public education campaigns that get buy-in not only from our riders, but from the general public, taxpayers, and our elected officials. Next slide. Super. Thank you, Chelsea, for... Oh, go ahead. That's all. Do you have something else? Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you, Chelsea. You've shown us some um, great examples of partnering and use of uh, education and educators and those students, that's great. And some very interesting ways to present da data. I know I can share some of that back with uh, my VRE group as well. So uh, one thing that I will add is that I've been amazed at the locations where I've had exposure to the concepts of sustainability. I learned that Villanova has a program in sustainability 
and that uh, the University of Maryland actually has a minor in sustainability, which I learned this last weekend at Maryland Day in College Park. So I'm going to begin the panel discussion to ask some questions and please be sure to use the tool to ask questions that you have. We don't have any on our screen yet, so we'll be looking for those too. And just as a reminder, the title of the webinar is Show Me the Money, the Business Case for Sustainability. So I'm going to direct the first question at um, uh, Clary or Chelsea. And this is, what are some of the benefits and savings you've seen since incorporating sustainability goals and objectives? And you each talked about this generally, but is there anything that's surprised you? And I'll ask first for Clary to mention something. Hi, Noreen. Um, I think recycling is an easy um, um, way of saving monies. Um, also, we developed a program for collection of catch basin grit. Um, that program, I'm still trying to um, uh, collect. It's it's a recent recently implemented program back in January, and we estimated that we would be saving in the vicinity of a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, like I had mentioned, I have over 700 uh, drainage systems to maintain. And to me, it's important to just kind of get creative when you're looking at maintenance activities. Um, another um, very quick and easy uh, return on investment would be to uh, replace um, uh, just light bulbs with LEDs. Um, it's it's a quick it's a quick way to ensure that we have a process for um, implementing initiatives that are quick on return on investment. Uh, since we're an operator, we need to make sure that our investment and our return on investment it's you know in a short term period of time. Um, but those three things um, really are have been beneficial in terms of um, cost recovery and uh, cost avoidance. Great, thank you. How about Chelsea? Anything that surprised you? Uh, Savings-wise, probably the most um, significant for us has been the transition from diesel to CNG fuel, and that the CNG um, diesel gallon equivalent has hovered around a dollar, um, and so it's withstood some of the variability in diesel prices and saved us substantially um, in terms of financial cost savings. On the benefit side, I think we've been very surprised at how many opportunities our program has offered for employee engagement, um, wow. whether it be training on, the, on alternative fuel vehicles um, or just some of the ways in which we've um, provided information to the employees. They've really bought in, and a lot of our frontline um, employees, such as drivers and customer service, I think have a lot of pride in, in what we do mm -hmm. and convey that to the community on a daily basis. Oh, that's excellent. Very good. So the next thing I want to turn to are challenges in implementing goals and objectives. And this could be either management challenges of convincing uh, your team of the priority or an implementation on the operations side. And I'm going to ask Amy this time if she can weigh in on this one. Hmm. Um, well, I guess I would say first and foremost, um, one of the things that really helped us um, was building champions. Like when we were, part, you know, mm -hmm. first starting our program, um, we worked closely with the operations department. And number one, um, the reporting that we do to show the benefits of operational efficiency um, was really helpful for operations staff to see that we were partnering with them um, to demonstrate to the agency how the work that they did um, was, was having benefits. So that was a really important part of um, sort of uh, building that collaborative relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And also um, one of the things that we do as a sustainability division is, you know, provide ourselves as sort of a resource for other departments around the agency to, um, you know, support with, a re you know, with research. Um, and so we sort of tried to cultivate it so that departments know that they can approach us to help them um, with problem solving. And so 
um, we made ourselves available to operations staff to um, you know, do some analysis about fuel efficiency of different bus types and alternative fuels and help them mm -hmm. navigate some of the new regulatory compliance um, and it, it was just sort of, I think that that slow process of relationship building um, mm -hmm. where they understood that we were really sort of, you know, not there to um, direct their work, um, but really support their work um, that mm -hmm. made future collaborative efforts um, more feasible. And so currently we're um, doing a, a number of studies around battery electric bus technology, and that's um, I would say the culmination of probably about eight years of collaborative work with our, our operations department. I don't think we could have done that two or three years ago, right, um, but it, it, it's the, the, the outcome of sort of that, that slow process of, of support and relationship building. Um, and being, you know, and I think just getting back to, you know, Pam and Clary's presentation, just being able to, to quantify um, all benefits and impacts um, has been very uh, crucial in in all of that work. Okay, very good. Now, looking at how a program matures, uh, what's a reasonable time for implementation? So, Chelsea, as a newer member to the change in application, what's your take on this? Um, I think, Although we've been somewhat involved with alternative fuel vehicles for um, you know well over 15 years now, I think the electric buses, it's taken us probably a good year um, to go through training programs, um, get ownership from employees, and develop the marketing and public relations piece um, to convey it to the community. Mm -hmm. And Clary, do you have anything to add on that as far as a reasonable time for implementation? Again, it, it depends on resources and um, and the support you have from your senior leadership. I think that is critical. Um, developing that uh, frontline support and your champions is important. Uh, for example, you know, we started back in July of 2014, and I'll be honest, um, people in January of 2015 were telling me, you will never implement an environmental management system for this railroad. I mean, I, I faced um, significant, you know, obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I, I was able to do it, but it only mm -hmm. took one person to support me to make it through. Um, and that senior leadership support is critical. And I was able to not only implement the environmental management system in less than a year, but I also got it certified, which was uh, impressive. Right after mm -hmm. called the Snowmageddon here in, in, in Boston. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you do come up uh, to significant challenges and um, uh, personalities that are really um, hard to convince. Uh, but all it takes is one one person that really does believe that this is important and that person really does help make things happen and i was yeah, lucky true. that one person in my team yeah. good well it's clear that we have movers and shakers on this call definitely very good um so the next thing I want to uh, ask about is about uh, prioritization. Does Is there a pri prioritization depending on the type or size of a transit agency? And I'd like to see what Pam thinks about that. When you're thinking prioritization, are you thinking about specific projects? Um, I'm thinking about a prioritization of implementing sustainability in an organization. So it could be, is it by department? Is it by individual project? Is it, how, how is the, what is, what are the prioritization thoughts? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I guess I would say that uh, 
one of the things you could think about is trying to prioritize projects that you've already identified as important to the agency through a sustainability lens. And the reason why I suggest that might be a way to do it is that sometimes it's required just generally to be part of uh, different funding plans, but um, it's also an introduction to the concept of sustainability for the agency as a whole. So if externally mm -hmm. you're being asked to prioritize things through a sustainability lens, that may provide you with some rationale for doing it internally as well. Mm -hmm. And I would okay. ask, does Chelsea, do you have any thoughts about that in terms of, uh, does it depend on the type or size of an agency? Yes, we've looked at kind of outside of sustainability, what we have coming in terms of capital and fleet investments and how we can incorporate sustainability into the things that we're already planning to do or have made progress toward. Um, and so we've really prioritized mostly on the capital side. Um, and I think right now we're kind of working with the after sustainability commitment and things that we can do, be doing on a day-to-day -day basis operationally and internally um, to meet some of those major investment priorities that we've been successful with. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to move to the community outreach. So you've given, several of you have given some examples of the passenger community or the local community. What are the benefits of doing that of having them engaged or involved or have an opinion or do public outreach. Um, so I guess I'd like to see if Pam has a comment on that. I think the benefits with outreach are that sometimes uh, it's just a big number. When we talk about investments, it always sounds like a really large capital cost. And, and of course, there's always the question of who will pay for it. And it's it, funding is perpetually a, a conflict point. So I think the advantage to trying to put some dollar values or at least quantify some of the uh, benefits of sustainability are that you can actually relay to the public how the project is or, or the investment at the agency is likely to impact them or impact society as a whole. You know, if we make this mm -hmm. investment, what does that mean to you in terms of improved access or quality of life or better connectivity or, uh, you know, cleaner water, cleaner air. And you can actually relay those things in metrics terms, which are sometimes an easy way to show the value of a project to people who may not understand it otherwise. Very good. How about Amy on this one about the involvement of the passenger community or the local community? Um, well, I would say for us, you know, I think we're in a little bit of a unique situation because we're in such a um, capital intensive phase um, and we're doing so much building um, that, you know, outreach and public process is, is a big part of, of what we do as an agency to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also joke about just the, the Northwest, just loving public process. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we have a very... Um, comprehensive outreach program and you know the so sometimes we do outreach on specific projects and initiatives we have or we um, we give information about the sustainability aspects of our current projects and um, one thing that's been really important for us in doing outreach to the public um, for example has been um, we've we have a number of programs to reduce uh, pollution from construction equipment which is often a, con a community concern. So we're able to sort of use some of the sustainability initiatives as part of our, our larger programs um, in working with, with the community to um, you know, be a good partner in, in this large infrastructure project that, that we're doing. Um, and what we've seen that's kind of interesting is we've probably, in, in terms of the external stakeholders that we um, do outreach for around sustainability issues, I would say probably some of the most interested parties are um, some of the nonprofit groups um, that are sort of the nonprofit community here in the region who are interested in our policies. And they've really sort of driven a lot of the agency's work around um, transit-oriented development and affordable housing, or, or sort of mm -hmm. the, the shift to focus on affordable housing within the TOD space. And then also, you know, we've done a lot of work, uh, my office specifically, with a number of um, jurisdictions 
that are really interested in, in making sure that as we develop our system further that we are um, you know building our stations with with sort of green principles in mind and so um, probably in the last six months the most stakeholder outreach I've done has been to a couple of small jurisdictions who um, through some of their permitting uh, work have, have have really demonstrated you know how they want to be a partner with us in all of this Wow very very good another example or several examples of partnering um, that's terrific so I'm going to ask now what advice would you give agencies or organizations just starting their sustainability program and I'll just use BRE as an example um, we don't do anything consciously as far as having a sustainable sustainability plan or program. We do take cars off the road, so that in itself is a good thing for commuter rail. Uh, we are expanding though, and so this is a very important time for us to take into consideration materials and processes. How about, um, uh, why don't I ask Clary about this one? So it's it's um, in terms of implementing uh, sustainability or you know just starting think, out kind of yeah. right starting out with kind of a thing I I do agree with Amy that an environmental management system is the first approach um, within the environmental management system you actually tackle you know some elements of sustainability that can be, you know, the, the basic foundation, if you will. Um, like uh, both Amy and Chelsea mentioned, and also Pam mentioned, um, the approach of tackling sustainability dimensions within the capital um, investment planning process is really important because each project has the potential to actually incorporate those dimensions and you can actually um, tie it um, ahead of the game, if you will, if you, if you actually quantify and value the benefits of that capital project and what's going to happen in terms of the, um, the deliverable and how that reflects back to the sustainability principles. But I think if, if you're starting from scratch and you're really struggling with resources and um, start by implementing an environmental management system, um, that environmental management system has a baseline foundation of a continual improvement program and that will get senior leadership to begin thinking about that continual improvement program process. Um, if you utilize the ISO 14001 um, uh, standards, it's a very, um, well, I consider it's, it's simple, but um, it depends on how many resources you have in-house to tackle mm -hmm. uh, implementation of a sustainability program. So I think starting with an EMS would be good. Okay, and Chelsea, since you're uh, kind of newer to the game, although that's kind of a misnomer at this point, um, what advice would you give agencies that are starting out? Um, I would, I would say to assess your resources internally. As for a small system, you know, I had mentioned our partnership with the university, but we had to um, assess what we could realistically take on with existing staff and where we needed to supplement that. Um, and also, again, employee engagement, um, starting in the very early stages, making sure that um, top to bottom employees understand you know, why you're looking at a sustainability program and the benefits that um, management feels it'll provide and getting their feedback in terms of um, deployment, I think was very uh, successful and helpful for us. Very excellent. That's that's a terrific response. Um, do you have any creative techniques for getting leadership on board to make sustainable goals part of an organization? So, Pam? I think you, the, the best way, obviously, to try to identify some goals is to actually sit down with the people who are um, most passionate about it and also who are likely to have uh, you know, a real 
excitement about trying to incorporate sustainability. I know we've done advisory groups where we've invited people who are within the agency, but then also uh, community groups outside of the agency to sort of think about sustainability and what that means to them. Um, if you there's a board involved, you know, involving them in sort of an advisory capacity in terms of how they define sustainability and what their goals might be for the agency is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but I think just getting interested parties around the table to start the conversation is probably the best first step. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you to all the panelists for your insights. Uh, wanted to move on to the audience participation part of our program. So if anyone in, your, in the audience has a question for our members, please submit those to the chat box. We have one already, so I know it works. Um, we'll read your questions aloud and then uh, we'll direct them to the panel members and we'll do our best to answer all the questions, look for more. So the first one is, what are some of the political barriers you've encountered implementing sustainability projects? especially projects that either have a long period before return on investment is realized or projects that don't have a clear financial return on investment. And I'm gonna start with Amy on this one. Repeat, repeat the beginning of the question again. What was I'm the political? Sorry. Um, what are some of the political barriers you've encountered implementing sustainable pro sustainable projects? Um, I mean, I, I guess I think sort of the question in some way sort of answers itself. Um, you know, that when when there aren't um, clear when there isn't a clear return on investment um, or payback in a reasonable time frame. You know, when the financials are um, not necessarily in your favor. Um, you know, I think that's when, when we have really relied on, um, you know, looking at the co-benefits, whether it's saving staff time, um, whether it's sort of uh, aligning with some of our important state, you know, what some of our important stakeholder groups are interested in, um, whether there's public health benefits that we can demonstrate, um, you know, but I would say that um, we would never, you know, even approach our leadership unless we had some sort of business case. And when I say business case, um, sort of reiterating what some of the other speakers have said, you know, it's not just um, making the financial case, um, but really just trying mm -hmm. to demonstrate what what the benefits are. Um, and one thing that's, that's always helpful, that's really um, helped us uh, when we're, you know, in that, you know, having, having that um, <laughs> dilemma, has been, um, you know, trying to talk about sort of what the good news stories are. Um, mm -hmm. And for getting back to your earlier question about, you know, some creative ways of engaging leadership, um, you know, initially our um, new CEO, or not so new CEO, but our, our CEO, Peter Rogoff, who came from FTA uh, and uh, the Federal Transportation Department, um, you know, he, he understood that sustainability was a regional, was a, um, a regional value. And um, and was appreciative of our program, um, but I think he really understood the value of our program. We started to get some very good press at a time when the agency was having um, some other public perception issues, and um, the fact that we were going to be participating in a utility effort to um, green our electricity use on our light rail gave us a lot of favorable um, press and. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of a nice, it was, it was a nice acknowledgement of sort of the public perception of our program. Um, and I think helped, you know, him appreciate us in a, in a different light. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, you were fortunate to have that individual come to your organization. That's for sure. How about Chelsea? Were there any political, um, political barriers that you had to deal with? And how did you do that? fortunate in terms of having local support, but I think part of why why we have had support and haven't had a, a lot of barriers has been that we really vetted um, our mission and goals for sustainability when we developed our strategic plan, and each time we update it. Um, and so we have some of those conversations on um, the direction that we're going prior to getting to a point where we're designing a facility or uh, purchasing buses. And there's some consensus among at least our governing board 
on the benefits of having a you know a sustainable program in place. Uh, but again, I would kind of echo what was just said that um, staff works really hard to make sure that we're um, researching and understanding that there will be a true benefit if there is going to be um, maybe a longer payback period or less financial incentive and explaining to our, our governing board and our elected officials on um, what those benefits are. Okay, great. Clary, would you like to add anything to that? I think in terms of implementing sustainability programs or even projects that incorporate sustainability dimensions requires for sure the buy-in of multiple stakeholders. Um, for example, you know, we we really and, and in transportation um, there's multiple um, multiple priorities that are constantly changing. Um, at least and that's my experience having worked uh, for Keolis for five years in the commuter rail services. Um, and you have to be able to adapt and kind of be flexible uh, when you prioritize um, sustainability um, components, you really have to be able to um, represent those with the value added, but also, you know, how does this benefit the day-to-day -day operations? Mm -hmm. And I really, um, I really frame a lot of the projects that I have on how I can incorporate um, sustainability dimensions into the objectives that my team is already spearheading. Um, when I add additional work for them, I know for a fact that that's not going to get approved because there's a competition for resources and, and mm -hmm. there's an amount of effort in implementing um, a project or an initiative or process change even. Um, so I guess, you know, understanding uh, your operations and your strategic plan, um, like Amy mentioned and like Chelsea mentioned, um, buying in to all these uh, processes that your operations have day to day and prioritizing your objectives within your sustainability, sustainability program and align those um, to the business operations teams objectives is really important. If you don't do that, sometimes, um, uh, unfortunately, um, it's more difficult to get any buy-in. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we have um, the ability to be flexible and to, you know, plan ahead and understand what the operations teams uh, need and the objectives that they have. Okay, great. Uh, that that good old communications needs to be a, a top priority as well in any kind of political challenges that you have. We have another question. Um, how does sustainability relate to resiliency? Resiliency has been another term that's come out. Are they the same or are they different? And let's see what Pam thinks about that. How does think, sustainability relate to resiliency? I think, uh, at least the way we interpret it, is that sustainability, and I tend to think of it through this triple bottom line perspective, so the economic, social, and uh, environmental piece. And then resiliency to me is, well, first of all, let me back up. When you make an investment, you're trying to figure out what are the things it's going to do, and you hope that it'll be financially feasible. You're looking for it to do something that's potentially positive for the environment, and you'd like to see some social factors like improved quality of life. Once you've made that investment, though, the resiliency is really making sure that the investment is going to last you know, the test of time. It'll meet the test of time. And so for me, it's all part of the decision-making process, but they are unique things. Sustainability is more about what will this do today, and resiliency, in my view at least, is more about what can we do to preserve this for the future. Okay, very good. And Chelsea, how about to you and your organization? What, how does sustainability re relate to resiliency? I guess, you know, we are looking at, and this is likely a different interpretation than was just provided, but when I think of resiliency, I think of um, how we plan for 
um, a reliable, consistent ability to provide service, um, especially right now when I look at like, um, you know, we're dealing with Midwest flooding and some of what, what was presented earlier in the slides um, and how we deal with changing climate. Um, and so in our sustainability uh, programs, one of the things that we're working on is how we um, tie in some of our alternative fuel vehicles or new technologies for our facilities um, with backup plans and emergency management plans and um, making sure that despite some of these new technologies that we won't have interruptions in service as, as new things um, come about. Mm. Interesting. Very good. All right. Let me ask another question here that I had in my goodie bag. Um, let's see. Have any of you used your sustainability program as a marketing strategy? Um, Amy, how about you? Um, well, I, well, I would say, again, you know, one of the things that's I guess the answer is, um, in some ways, yes. <laughs> um, you know, when we've gone out to talk to communities where we're going to be building light rail, um, you know, we we talk a lot about how, um, you know, one of the most important things that the region can do to be more sustainable is to, to build uh, is to build transit um, and mm -hmm. to give people uh, affordable, uh, environmentally friendly transportation options. So, you know, in the proposition, I would say overall for for our expansion um, project. Um, you know, we sort of, you know, talk about the value proposition of, of transit as sustainable, um, as well as, you know, the fact that we're going to be um, building in a sustainable manner. So transit, you know, it's not just what we do that's sustainable, it's also how we do it. Um, and then I think, you know, something that um, Pam touched on as well that I think has been, you know, also really important for us is um, in federal funding opportunities. Um, with new starts, for example, in your cost effectiveness calculations, they allow you to zero out the cost of the capital costs for green building um, as well and, and infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, as we think that it's a, an important way that we can distinguish ourselves when we're competing um, with other regions for projects as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, um, you know, has, has come into play as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, I don't see any other questions on that. Um, <clears throat> on our chat box, um, <clears throat> I want to thank all of the participants. I want to thank our audience for all of the great uh, patience that you've had in sitting through the conversation that we had. Uh, I want to thank Clary, Chelsea, Amy, Pam, and also thank Elizabeth for helping us put the parts and pieces to put it together. So thank you everyone. And I'll turn it back to Elizabeth. Wonderful. Thank you, Noreen. And you did an amazing job moderating. So we really appreciate it. Um, you know, clearly this topic is a is an important one. And you know, I can't thank all the participants enough for you know sharing your experiences as well as your expertise. Um, the Sustainability Committee hopes to continue providing training and, and, and providing a place to share those best practices for its, its members moving forward. Uh, and not just the committee members, but all APTA members. Um, you know, so I want to end the, the webinar with kind of a call to action. Uh, if, if you're listening and you have some follow-up ideas for either additional webinars, you know, perhaps we need a part two to this webinar or, or maybe a deeper dive at an upcoming APTA conference, um, or perhaps there's some research that you think that needs to be completed to help further the mission of sustainability. Um, please feel free to reach out to us, you know, reach out to me directly. Um, you know, again, my name is Elizabeth Lovingood. I'm, I'm the staff advisor to the committee and you can, you can find my contact information on the APTA website or on the committee page. It's elovinggood at APTA.com. And uh, we're just really hoping to see something useful and concrete uh, come out of this uh, session today. So thank you again to the participants and to the audience for, for listening in. Uh, I just want to end with uh, to let you know that today's slides, uh, as well as the audio recording, and as well as some additional resources will be shared via email uh, as a follow-up, as well as posted on the committee page. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you.